afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Tim Cruz, and I'm the chairman of the board and the directors of the Kansas Health Institute. I would like to just share with you today is my last day uh, serving on the board. And uh, just a disclaimer for myself, if your Twitter account goes down, I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> On behalf of the board and staff, I would like to thank you all for coming to help us celebrate the life of Dr. Combine and all the great developments of downtown Topeka. We are fortunate to do, get to do our work providing credible health policy expertise to poly, policy makers right across the street from our beautiful state house. Thank you to the Kansas Health Foundation for creating the Institute in 1995 and providing the support to make KHI what it is today. Thank you also to KHF for funding the wonderful statue of Dr. Combine for our pocket park. It is my honor and my pleasure to introduce Steve Cohen, President, of, President and CEO of the Kansas Health Foundation. Please help me welcome. Thank you, Tim. Sad to see you leave this organization. You've been a wonderful board member and given great service to KHI. So. Thank you very much. Well, good afternoon to all of you, and thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of this wonderful celebration today. Uh, the unveiling of the park with the Sandal Crowbite statue certainly is a culmination of a lot of hard work on behalf of the Kansas Health Institute staff and board for these past 12 months. It's wonderful to see this all come to fruition after our early discussions about this pocket park many, many months ago. Um, uh, last year at this time, we were celebrating uh, with KHI on the, on the wonderful opening of this facility here, and it, we were so pleased to be a part of helping all bring that all to culmination too. And today, the public gets to understand more about the mission of this organization with the Healthy Park and the Samuel Crumbine statue. And Bob, I want to congratulate you, your board and staff, with your vision and planning to make all this happen here today. <laughs> you know, seeing where KHI is today is incredibly amazing, considering where things were before the Kansas Health Institute was started. And I want to take us back to the early 1990s, when the Kansas Health Foundation was first thinking about how we could get accurate, objective health data in our state. Because, to be honest, it just didn't exist at that time. I'm sure for many younger folks, although we don't have a whole lot of really younger folks in the room here today, it's hard to imagine when there wasn't so much information available with a simple Google search. Uh, but that's really the way it was back then. It was very difficult to get research and background data about Kansas health issues at that time and especially timely and unbiased information. And recognizing these challenges and the potential benefits to many organizations across the state of Kansas, the Kansas Health Foundation created and funded the Kansas Health Institute, as I mentioned earlier, in 1995. The model of KHI as a state-focused, non-biased, non-partisan health policy and research organization has been widely recognized and valued over the years. And I have to say, this model has been created by other health foundations across the nation. And many have come here and visited this organization and have used this as a model to create their own similar organizations in other states. So we've been proud to be a part of this continuing relationship with KHI and how the work continues to improve the health of all Kansans. But today we're here to celebrate Samuel Crumbine and his significant impacts to improve public health. We know at the Kansas Health Foundation that public health system change benefits not just individual health, but entire populations, and the entire population of the state of Kansas. For those of you that are here today who may not know much about the Kansas Health Foundation, I thought I might just spend a few moments telling you a little bit about who we are. We were formed from the sale of Wesley Medical Center back in 1985. Our organization received the proceeds at that point of about $230 million from the sale of that hospital to focus on health in Kansas. Since 1985, the foundation has given away nearly $500 million in grants to benefit the health of Kansans and build stronger, healthier communities across the state of Kansas. 
and through sound investments, the foundation's assets have also grown during that period to nearly a half a billion dollars, thus providing us resources to help Kansans make healthy choices where they live, work, and play. Our board has always focused most of its interest and funding on public health since we were first created, or on ways to prevent health problems from occurring in the first place, instead of trying to address health problems once they exist. Early in our history, we became aware of Samuel Crumbon and adapted his work of no spinning on the sidewalks and clean indoor air policies and his campaigns to ban the public drinking cup and the cloth towel rollers in restrooms have paved the way for many health department awareness messages like coughing into your elbow and into hand washing campaigns. The foundation was so impressed with Dr. Cram Crumbine that we even commissioned a play to help share his public health story as a way to educate Kansans about the importance and the role of public health in our society. Kansas Health Foundation was also the underwriter for a first person portrayal of Dr. Crumbine that the Kansas, Health, Kansas Humanities Council presented for several years across the state. Any organization today that has any role in changing health behaviors and providing health care should celebrate the significant legacy that Samuel Crumbine left for us as the foundation to improving health in our state. On behalf of the Kansas Health Foundation board and staff, thank you for allowing us to be a part of this exciting celebration. And today it is my honor to introduce the Crumbine family members that are with us today. And I'll start with a reminder of two who helped us with the unveiling of the statue. Dave, Jay Carter Crumbine, a great, great grandson. Oh, they're out coloring. Oh, they're out coloring. Okay, well, that's I can see why they would do that. And his sister, Ziza K. Crumbine, a great great granddaughter, also out coloring. <laughs> What's that? Living out one great. One great. Great 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 grandson. Great 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 granddaughter. Sorry about that. Other family members David Jordan Crumbine. David's here. And Alicia Crumbine. And we are also fortunate to have one of Dr. Crumbine's great grandchildren here who will share some remarks with us this afternoon. Please join me in welcoming Dennis J. Dennis. spell my name. <laughs> <laughs> the statue was really marvelous. Um, we saw it last night and uh, I gave it a little hug. Of course, I didn't know Dr. Crumbine when he was that age, but anyways. <laughs> I'm one of four great grandchildren of Dr. Crumbine. My brother Peter and my sisters Katie and Nancy couldn't make it today, but they wanted to make sure that I expressed their thanks along with mine to uh, Kansas Health Institute, the uh, city of Topeka, and uh, Bob St. Peter, and all of you for making this possible. Sixty years ago, make it 66 years ago, an 11 year old boy and his 13 year old brother got on a train in Cleveland, Ohio, bound for New York City. They were nervous, but excited. They were going to meet Dr. Crumbine, our great-grandfather. The doctor in Dodge City, a friend of Bat Masterson, who witnessed the gunfights, and the man who raised our father. He corresponded with Calvin Coolidge and Herbert Hoover. He outlawed the, outlawed the public drinking cup and saved thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of lives in the process. And he invented the Dixie cup. Nah, we made that up. <laughs> so I'll take you back another uh, 90 years to September 17th, 1862. Lincoln was president, the Civil War still had three years to run, and Samuel J. Crumbine was born to Sarah Moe 
named Samuel D. Crumbine in a little town in western Pennsylvania, Edmonton, and in a log cabin. Samuel's father was an enlistee in the Pennsylvania Volunteers, fought in the Civil War, was captured by the Confederacy, and imprisoned in the infamous and disease-ridden Libby Prison. He died of typhoid fever two weeks before Samuel was born. <coughs> Samuel's mother was impoverished. She had two young children. She had no choice but to let her grandmother raise the two children, Grandmother Mo. She was also a widow, a strict, God-fearing woman, but kind and supportive to little Samuel. So from there, Mercer Boarding School for Civil War Orphans, <coughs> Pharmacy School, Cincinnati School of Medicine, where he was first in his class, Dodge City, Topeka, Washington, and New York City. And he worked his way through all of those schools. Obviously, he did not start with a silver spoon. Back to the boys on the train. In our time with Dr. Crumbine, he was kind, had a sense of humor, told us about one gunfight. <laughs> he was patient. He was very old to a boy of 11. He was 90. But we were in awe. He did not admit, however, to knowing Marshall Dillon or Festus. <laughs> and it's, you know, a few people old enough to uh, get that one. Dr. Crumbine's respect for integrity and hard work came to us directly through our father. Many owe a debt to Dr. Crumbine, we descendants especially. We are all very proud of him. Now just a little genealogy, and then I'll, I'll quit. Dr. Crumbine had two children, a daughter, Violet, and a son, Warren. Warren was the light of his life. His only son, a handsome lad. In 1915, he and his new bride moved to Shanghai, China, working for an American company. At the age of 24, Warren contracted pneumonia and died. Dr. Crumbine was heart heartbroken, as you can imagine. Warren's wife, Beulah Searle, was pregnant with our father, also Warren, when her husband died. She returned home from China to have her baby to live with her parents in Ohio. Two years later, she was also gone from the flu. Warren was an orphan and an only child, our father. He lived with his mother's family until the age of 10 and then moved to New York City to live with Dr. and Mrs. Crumbine. Violet, Dr. Crumbine's daughter, had one child who was a wonderful woman. She was an opera star musical comedy, and we were all very close to her, loved her very much. Unfortunately, she did not have any children, so Dr. Crumbine's line rested solely on the shoulders of young Warren. Well, he did okay. There are 21 living descendants of Dr. Crumbine, four of whom are here today. I was going to introduce them. They got introduced outside, and I guess I'm so that, it's considerably short in my speech. <laughs> but where are the kids? They're, they're still out coloring? Uh, so again, on behalf of our family, thank you so much for this wonderful tribute. And I'm going to give this microphone to my nephew, David. Uh, he wants to say a couple of things. I have a, a deep, uh, I'm a teacher, it's very hard for me to use this. <laughs> Teachers are just loud. <laughs> um, I have a deep appreciation for my great-great-great-great-grandfather, um, and not for the historical, profound, deep reasoning you might be thinking. Um, but according to my brother, I'm an absolute clean freak. And I finally <laughs> understand. <laughs> I finally last week or two, it really dawned on me where it all came from. <laughs> uh, and my wife has had to live with uh, the oddness
list of, of my habits, but frankly, I believe that the legacy has carried on. When I see my daughter use her knuckle in the elevator to press the elevator button, <laughs> when my son will not touch the inside door handle of a bathroom, but will go to the paper towel dispenser not to dry his hands. He knows he can do that on his pants, which is cleaner. <laughs> And he, uh, he will grab the paper towel uh, to open up the door. Speaking of which, he, he went on, Dr. Cromine went on crusade after crusade to increase health awareness. And, and as you all know, I don't understand why, I think he would appreciate this, why are there door handles on the inside of bathroom doors? That's got to be the most disgusting thing imaginable. In case you don't know, some people don't wash their hands. Um, so clearly, I also really appreciate this building, because um, I went to use the restroom last night when we came in, and I was shocked that there were no sinks. Um, and I'm looking around, and I thought, this is truly the first bathroom I've ever been in that has no sink. Um, I thought this was a health institute, I was very confused. <laughs> but I, I gave two thumbs up when I left. One, because there is no... Thank you. Um, there is no door handle, and, and then there was this glor glorious sink and soap and scents and everything on the outside. Um, but <laughs> I will stop. I just wanted to share that. I have been on teachers going for a long time. I wanted to, to, to personally come down. Both I've learned so much of the history of my great great grandfather, but in, in some very odd way that I think he would appreciate. Um, my brother calls me OCO. I'm not OCD, not obsessive compulsive, obsessive compulsive disorder, but I have obsessive compulsive order. <laughs> Finally, someone in the family understands me. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I'm, Alton, you can stay right there if you'd like to. I uh, now have the privilege of introducing um, Alton Lee, who wrote the biography, the wonderful biography that you saw on the table there of Dr. Crumbine, and just give him the opportunity to say a few things here. And he's <coughs> got a microphone right there. Now, thank you. Uh, I had my say about this day in the last line I wrote in the biography of uh, Dr. Combine, so all I'll say now is uh, I'm so gratified today to know that Samuel Combine, who gave so much to his country and to his world in public health issues, <laughs> receiving so many uh, recognition that he so richly deserves. I'm very happy to see this day. Thank you. first meet Alton and his wife Marilyn at a cafe in Manhattan, I said, how in the world did you end up writing this story? And you had retired and moved from, I, I should, being from Kansas, I'm sensitive to this, North Dakota, South Dakota, darn it, I was going to say. <laughs> and he said, I was just looking for interesting characters to write a story about. And I learned about Dr. Crumbine and, and picked him. And, uh, thank you so much for contributing that wonderful piece to keeping alive the history and the legacy of, of Dr. Crumbine. And Carson, I'd like to give you the opportunity. You met, I introduced Carson outside, um, the artist, he and his father, who created the, the beautiful statue. Thank you very much. Well, as a artist, it's always a, uh, a very rewarding uh, experience to be able to one, get to do a sculpture of somebody that is such, of such prominence, but then also to work with such a great team, uh, working with KHI and Bob and, and the rest of his team have just been awesome, uh, really rewarding, and it's really interesting to get to hear these stories directly from the family and get into each project that I do um, gives you a little insight into the personal lives of these individuals. and. Looking at a photograph, because in my line of work, that's a lot of the times the only thing that I have to go from. Uh, and most of the time, they're old, faded photographs that are 
uh, they leave out a lot of information. So how do you bring this person back to life? It can be a real challenge sometimes. And so when David stands up here and he motioned just like the <laughs> skull right there. Oh man, you know, because as an artist, you're you're looking at visual cues all the time, facial structure. You know, everybody here in the medical field but understand the anatomy. That's like a day in day out aspect to what I do as a sculptor, uh, working two dimensional and in, in, in paintings. You know, you, you do have to pay attention to that and how light reflects it and everything. But when it comes to sculpture, you can't mess it up. Uh, or you shouldn't. Uh, <laughs> and so it was, it's, it's great to see, as soon as De I saw Dennis today, I knew, it's like, he's part of the family. I hadn't met him yet. You instantly know, because I don't know how many hours I stood there in front of Dr. Crumbine. I, I don't know if you've, uh, some of you might have seen some of the different pictures of me standing in front of a half Dr. Crumbine, like I have the upper torso on, an e on a, uh, a tripod, so it's easier to reach him. But, uh, point being is you spend a lot of time trying to capture who this person is, not only just in uh, you know their life's work and paying homage to it, but then also as a person. Uh, one specific thing that I remember about when I was reading through his uh, Dr. Carmine's book, and it struck me personally because of my children. I've got a six-year-old, or a, a, sorry, a four-year-old daughter and a seven-year-old son. Dr. Carmine was talking about when he was in the cellar. And this was when his son, I believe, was four or seven, Warren, um, was standing, I think he was four, uh, standing at the top of the stairs going down into the cellar. And Dr. Carmine told him, jump. Just joking. And, but the, um, uh, Warren actually started to jump and actually went ahead and committed. And if Samuel wouldn't have been paying attention, that he would fall on. But I think that's really interesting to think of how he, Dr. Crumbine, throughout his life, understood from that simple moment. He said that made a very impactful uh, mark on his mind because of what his word, how his word affected everybody else around him. And so I think it's really a interesting thing to think about when we look at his public campaigns and you know the, the word, the message that he was putting out and trying to, uh, you know, uh, make the world a better place uh, and uh, help society in general. Sincere, sincere effort to um, to um, help people out. So, anyway, again, thank you very much, Bob, and KHI and Kansas Health Foundation. It's been great. Uh, just a few uh, closing thoughts here. Um, thank you all for being here to. Uh, make this story about Dr. Crumbine so real and so personal, having all the, the different perspectives of people who have known him from lots of different perspectives. Um, I want to recognize two other people who have helped uh, with us gain an understanding of Dr. Crumbine. Um, Don McInnes from the Clendenning Library at the KU School of Medicine uh, is a wealth of information and from the moment she got our first email was just uh, gracious <laughs> in sending information and sharing uh, everything you knew about him. And I hope you've learned some too from meeting the family and seeing some of the materials they brought. But thank you so much for your help. <laughs> Justin Castor, who is a professor at K-State, and he runs the uh, Frontier Program at K-State, which is a program that looks at food safety uh, issues uh, from a, a global perspective, and they always have a focus on some aspect of Dr. Crumbine's work, and he recruited some of his students to prepare the material that is on the website. There are QR codes out in the park, and if you scan those, you'll be taken to some web material uh, put together by the students in that program. So thank you all for participating. There are two awards that are given in Dr. Crumbine's honor. Uh, there's a national award that, uh, that recognizes local health departments who excel in issues related to food safety. And that award has been given for many, many years. And coincidentally, the current 
winner of that award, the 2017 winner of that award, is actually the Kansas City, Missouri Health Department. So wow. there's a national award in recognition of, of the uh, legacy of Dr. Crumbine. And in addition, the Kansas Public Health Association gives an award annually. It is the highest award that the association gives in recognition of significant contributions to improving health in Kansas, and it's called the Crumbine Award. And I know we have a few Crumbine Award winners in the room. If you're a, a Crumbine Award winner, could you just stand real quickly and be recognized? I, nobody's mentioned it yet, and I don't know, this doesn't really fit in, so I'm just going to throw it in there. The biography of Dr. Crumbine, he wrote that when he was 86 years old. The precision of the, the storytelling. Um, I had the opportunity to see a, a book that came into the possession of uh, Jim Barnett that actually has a signature by Dr. Crumbine to a dear friend of his in New York written less than a month before his death in perfect penmanship. He started his training when he was 17, from what I could tell in, uh, in uh, reading the different sources. So he was an amazingly productive person from 17 until a very ripe old age, until he passed at 91, just not long before his 92nd birthday. But what an amazing person and a mind he must have been and had to uh, under, do this undertaking at 86 years of age. So why is Dr. Crumbine's story and, and his life, why are we compelled to uh, repeat that story in the work that we do here at KHI? And I, I'll, I'll make this brief and I'll focus it on the parts because that's what we're here to talk about. And we tried to capture the essence of that question why are we compelled to tell his story? Uh, in the quotes that we put in various parts of the park. And I'll just uh, talk a little bit about some of those. Hopefully you've seen the engravings in the uh, pavers that are out in the park. If not, you can check them out on your, your way out. First is his unfailing belief in the power of education, and in particular, health education, and the need to give people the tools and the insight to help themselves, help their neighbors, help their families lead a healthy life. And the challenges of getting people to change their behavior in 1885 when he moved to Dodge City or in 1904 when he became Secretary of the Board of Health, there was no easier back then to get people to change their behavior than it is right now. But he understood the importance of educating people and empowering them to make good decisions. So there are three quotes out there. One says, I determined to go straight to the people with the program of health education. He had a, a unbridled faith in people if they had the right information and the right tools to make good decisions. Another uh, quote is, in the long run, lasting victories are won by telling people the truth. And that's what we hope to embody as an organization at KHI, putting good information out there, letting people use it in, in ways that they can to, to make good policy. And finally, we suffer from disease through ignorance, we may escape through knowledge. If we can remove ignorance and replace that with knowledge, we have the power to be healthy. He had very infamous campaigns related to public health. You've seen them all. Swat the fly, bat the rat, ban the common drinking cup, don't spit on the sidewalk, out the common roller towel. They're all out there also. <clears throat> Second was his focus on children. He understood the importance of children. Hearing the compelling personal stories of both uh, Dr. Crumbine and his son uh, being orphans, <coughs> and uh, being influenced and shaped by a community of people around them that enabled them to accomplish such things in their life, he understood the importance of focusing on children. As a pediatrician, that uh, resonates with me. Uh, but, but in a way, in, uh, he saw something else that was not typical at the time. 
he understood the importance of the social conditions that people lived in and the importance that that had on their future health. This concept of social determinants of health, which is something we've heard a lot of conversation about recently in our state and other states. But, but back in that day, he understood the power and the role of those social conditions on influencing children's health. One of the quotes near his statue says, the faith of the world centers around the interests of the child. He went on after he left Kansas to run the American Child Health Association and had a profound influence across the country and the world on improving the health of children. At the uh, table out near the elevator, there's a letter from the President of the United States asking Dr. Crumbine to go look at the child health conditions in Puerto Rico. And he took that charge seriously and delivered a very impactful report back to the world, really. Finally, uh, his belief that, and this is a quote, the health of each of us depends on the health of all of us. You know, that's really what it's all about for all of us in our lives and in our work. You know, we want to, no matter what our position is, our, our role, uh, we're all out to improve our own well-being, the well-being of our family, of our neighbors, of our community, our city, our state, our nation, maybe even our world. And his commitment to that throughout his career for the betterment of everybody and understanding the need to include everybody in these broad-based approaches to health improvement, I think, were, were central, again, to the kind of work that, that KHI tries to do. I will close with a quote from another famous Kansan, uh, William Allen White, who was a big fan of Dr. Crumbine's. At one point when the, uh, Dr. Crumbine was Secretary of the Board of Health, he couldn't get $250 for an uh, initiative that he wanted to do, and the governor was unable to come up with that. You're, you probably could, you know, $250, that doesn't sound like such a big challenge now, but back then it was a big, big amount of money. William Allen White actually wrote to 10 of his good friends and asked them each to send in $10 to support this public health initiative that they could not come up with money uh, from the state treasury for. And William Allen White was an unbridled fan and supporter of Dr. Crumbine. And he wrote, along with Kansas heroes, John Brown, Jim Lane, John J. Ingalls, Ed Howe, General Funston, and now General Eisenhower, the name of Dr. Samuel J. Crumbine should be written well toward the top for his work was constructive, successful, and lasting. Kansas should honor him in its gallery of heroes. I thank all of you for uh, helping to bring that to life and being here today to celebrate it. Thank you very much.